study tonight. I'd like to ask Sister Everett, ma'am, if you'll pray over our Bible study, please. Gracious Lord, we do thank you for who you are. We thank you for the opportunity to learn more about you. Lord, we ask that we would learn and that we would grow in grace. Father, be with Pastor. Help him to teach. God, give him the word of eternal life that he may lift Jesus up higher and higher. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Saints, it's good to have you all with us in Bible study tonight. Last week, we finished chapter 6. We left off dealing with how it's dangerous to reminisce about the old life. And we told you about Frank the Tank. We got to forget about the Frank the Tank days, right? But Paul the Apostle here in the, at, toward the end of Romans chapter 6, Toward the end of Romans chapter 6, verse 20, he said, What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. When we look back on the quote-unquote good old, good old days, the devil can use that to ensnare us. Folks, we are what we think. Jesus said, Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Paul said you should be ashamed of how you used to live before Christ. Why? Because it worked death. We want to do a quick recap on freedom. He said in verse 22 of Romans chapter 6, he says, but now you are free from sin and you're, you're the servants of God. He said, but now you are free from sin and you're the servants of God. At least we should be. If I'm reading my Bible correctly, he said, ye have fruit to righteousness and the end everlasting life. He said, ye have fruit to righteousness, unto righteousness and the end everlasting life. He said this because we're free, amen, from that which held us hostage. Now he's telling us we should have some fruit, some different fruit. He said we should have fruit to holiness, unto holiness. Now what in the world is holiness? It's purification. Holiness is sanctification. It's separation to God. He said you should live a life that is separated to God, devoted to God. Is it that way with you tonight? Are you devoted to God? If we're doing that which is contrary to God, well, then we're saying we are not separated to God. We're not set aside. We're not in a relationship with God. And if we're not in a relationship with God, well, Paul is saying you're not free. You're not free from sin. See, we cannot be free. We cannot be servants to God. We cannot live a life that's holy until we go to Calvary and die. We must look at the death, burial, and resurrection to, of Jesus if we're going to live for him. Amen? That means I've got to do exactly what Jesus told the disciples to do. He said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. See, that's living for God. He said, if you want to follow me, you have to deny yourself. You have to take up your cross, and you have to follow him. See, this is really the answer to deliverance, to freedom. Dying to self, amen. Dying to self-confidence. Dying to self-ambition. And anything else that usurps the authority or takes the place of God, we have to die to. It. And then we have to follow Christ. Paul said, for the wages of sin is death. And that's Romans chapter 6, verse 23. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. He said the wages of sin, the payment of living a life that's unholy is death. Now, we all going to die. We already know that. We're all going to die. <clears throat> Excuse me. But the death that Paul here is referring to, saints, he's referring to a spiritual death, being eternally separated from God forever. That place is called hell. See, if a man or woman, as we mentioned last week, Live without God, they die without God. See, if you don't live for God on this side of eternity, you can't live for God on the other side 
of eternity. And so Paul, he's telling us, amen, that God pays you for how you live. He gives us a payment for how we live. If we live holy, we'll receive holiness. If we don't live holy, we'll receive death. He said, for the wages of sin, doing that which is contrary to God, missing the standard. He says, that's death. That's eternal separation for God, from God. But then he, I'm thankful he didn't stop there. He transitions and then he says, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The gift of God, the unmerited favor of God is eternal life, everlasting life. Through only one man, the man Christ Jesus. You've got a lot of people that don't read the Bible. Lick. They'll tell you you can live however you want to live and you'll be right. That could not be further from the truth. It may sound good, but it sure don't sound Bible, does it? He said, for the wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Our Lord. If we are still living how we live before we prayed the prayer of salvation, something is not right with our hearts. Because Paul tells us in Romans 6, and we're about to say it wait, here in a little bit to Romans chapter 7, but we want to do a quick recap and close it out. If, there's, if we prayed the sinner's prayer or the prayer of salvation and, and, and we've come to Christ, we understand that, first of all, there is none righteous, no, not one. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We understand that how sin was brought into the world through Adam, and because it's sin, death has passed upon the whole human race, and all have sinned. We understand that the wages of sin is death. If I keep living a life that's outside of the will of God, I will die without God. We understand that Jesus paid the price for our sin, but when we were without strength, Christ died for the ungodly. For God commended his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I'm thankful, amen, that there is a gift in God, amen, that God has a gift for us. See, it is through Christ we receive the gift of God. Folks, God wants to give us a gift. He's not trying to take anything from us. Except for our old bad habits, our stinking birth when we smoke them, them cowboy kills, them cigarettes. He's trying to take, he wants to give us a fruitful life now, amen. He doesn't want to give us yellow teeth. He doesn't want to give us bad birth. He doesn't want to give us anything that's not like him. Amen? And so we understand that the gift of God gift of God, will work full salvation, fullness of salvation. This is what it refers to. Fullness of salvation. The gift of God. Let's talk about the gift a little, a little more. In Titus chapter 2, verse 11, starting at verse 11, we're talking about the gift of God. Amen? For the, gift, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation have appeared to some men. No, the Bible says all men. For the grace of God has appeared to all men. This is the gift. The word grace means unmerited favor. He said the grace of God has appeared to all men. That includes women. He said this. He said teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we shall live soberly. Whoa, preacher, now you tripping. Now I ain't tripping, I'm telling you what the Bible says. He said, the grace of God, it teaches us something. To live like a devil? No, to live like a Christian. He said, denying godliness and worldly lust, worldly desires. We should live soberly. He's telling us what to do. He said, we should live a certain way now. If you're naming the name of Christ, you should act like it. He said, you should live soberly righteously and godly in the world to come. No, he says, in this present world. He said we should live like Jesus lived now. The moment we confess Jesus as our Lord and Savior, yes, we have a home in heaven, but God, by his grace and his mercy, he teaches us to deny ungodliness in this present world. He said this in uh, Titus chapter 2, verse 13. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. That's what we're looking for. That's what the Christian is looking for tonight. Hope. And expect it in. You're not hopeless. You got to expect it in. God said he, he said, says he knows his thoughts towards you. Thoughts of peace. Thoughts to give you an expected end. The grace of God empowers us to live without sin. The grace of God, unmerited faith, that sounds a lot different than our contemporary friends, doesn't it? The grace of God empowers us to live a life without sin, 
Not sin and God got me covered. No, that's not what the grace of God does. Don't, don't God will forgive sins, amen? But the grace of God should teach you to stay away from it, to abstain, to avoid the very appearance of evil. That's what the Bible tells us. Why would Jesus go through all that he had went through during his 33 years away from the Father for us to live ungodly, Christian? Why would Jesus have gone through, have gone through everything that he's went through for us to live ungodly? Jesus came to empower you to live, empower you and show you how to live in earth today. The Bible says Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. Christ suffered, amen. Now I know it hurts to suffer, but Jesus suffered to leave us an example. This shows us his humanity. He knows what it's like to suffer, and he can help you tonight. The Bible says this, who did no sin, neither was God found in his mouth. He didn't lie. He didn't tell a half lie. He didn't slick lie. The Bible says he did no sin. Neither was God the seat found in his mouth. He said, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. When he was reviled, Christian, he reviled not again. Now, are the folks at New Testament Christian Church of Portland, you know the word reviled? It means basically cursed out. When they cursed him and mocked him, he didn't mock him or curse him back out. But he committed himself to God. And folks, you can't add hair to your head. You can't add height to your stature. You have to commit yourself to God. You get upset, ain't going to change anything. It's just going to make the devil mad, happy, and, and you mad. And so folks, really... As Christians, amen, we should be different because the Bible, if I read my Bible correctly, Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17, that we're new creatures in Christ. He said, old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. God gives us power. Yes, he works salvation, but he also has sent the Holy Ghost, has brought down his spirit. The same spirit that rose Christ from the dead. It now lives in us if you want it or if you want him. The spirit of God can empower us to live just like Jesus lived in the world. Folks, when you begin to look at the ministry of Christ, it was a short ministry, only three years. But Christ did not start his ministry until he got filled with the Holy Ghost. In the river Jordan, the Bible says the Holy Ghost came down upon him. Descended like a dove. And then he was led into the wilderness, amen. The Spirit of God came down on him. And then he was led by the Spirit of God into the wilderness. You cannot make it for God without being a man or woman fully dependent on God, the Father, and the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost will give you the victory over, our, over your attitude. See, it's easy for us to say no to everybody else. But you know it's hard, who it's hard to say no to? That flesh. But the Holy Ghost teaches us how to say no to that flesh. And this is all through the work of Christ, amen. The work of Christ, amen. Him being obedient, even the death of the cross. Christ making it possible, amen, for us to obey God. He left us an example, saints. Let's talk about being released from the law. In Romans chapter 6, verse 14. He said this. For sin shall not have dominion over you. Stop saying you can't help it. The Bible says sin shall not have dominion over you if you're dead to it. He said, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. Oh, yeah, that means I can sin now. No, no, it doesn't. Remember I told you what the gift of God teaches you. Or what the grace of God teaches you. It teaches you to deny ungodliness. So it does not mean that. It means that we have power over our flesh now. That's what it means. Whereas before, we, the devil told us to jump. We just did whatever we wanted to, Christian. But now God has empowered us, amen, to say no to the flesh. And that's the great secret of the hour. We're released from the law. Let's look at Romans chapter 7. Sister, Evan, can you turn that? Romans chapter 7, verse 1. 
Paul the Apostle is speaking here. We're in Romans chapter 7, verse 1. He says, Know ye not, brethren, he's talking to Christians, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. So then if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. Wow. But if her husband be dead, she is free from the law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. All right, let's talk about this a little bit. Paul, he uses marriage as an analogy to further pr prove his point in chapter 6. To further pr prove his point in chapter 6, if you re recollect in chapter 6, he was dealing with the analogy of slavery. And how you obey who you serve, i.e. your employer. They tell you to come in at 7, you come in at 7. Why? Because you obey them. You want that check. If you don't do it, they fire you. They find somebody else. We obey who we serve. And so he begins to use this analogy, this analogy concerning marriage. And we'll get into it in a little bit, but hold on. Let me deal with some things really quick. Saints, it's inconceivable that the Christian should sin. Our lives are now to be lived under a new order of obedience. Remember, Paul said we obey who we serve. He talked about that in Romans 6, verse 16 through 17. Only the man that has been set free from sin can serve God in obedience. Ayaka. Only the man or woman that has been set free can serve God in obedience. That's what the scripture mean when, means when Jesus says, who the Son sets free is free indeed. Well, if I'm not living like a Christian, well, obviously, I'm not free because I'm not obeying God. Jesus said in another place, if you love me, keep my commandments. My commandments are not grievous and so forth. But let's keep going. The one that has not, oh, the one that has not, has not been free. They're the ones that always make, make excuses, excuses. They justify themselves. Paul said it this way, that lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such turn away. They're lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. That's why they can't please God. And so they deny the power of God. They tell you they justify everything they do, but they can find fault with what you do. You ever notice now, people that don't serve God, they know, amen, when you're not serving God and you name the name of Christ. They'll, if you do something contrary to God, I guarantee you they'll start being a Bible club. Because they have an ideal, they have opinions, they have some sense of ideal that a Christian shouldn't be living like a sinner. But the Christian does not have an ideal. And so Paul, he's saying, man, if you're lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, you're denying the power of God. Because the power of God gives you power to say no. Yes, yeah, as I mentioned, it's easy to say no to other people, but the power of God gives you power to say no to your attitude. When it wants to rise up, when you feel offended, when we're in our hurt feelings. Have you been there? I have. Paul said, Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law have dominion over a man as long as he liveth. Surely you know this. This is what he's saying. He said, Surely you know this. That a dead man is no longer subject to prosecution. Now that's rocket science. That's kindergarten. If somebody's dead, they can't be prosecuted. They can't be put on trial. Although they may have committed crimes and they may have been found guilty. They can't be sentenced in man's courtroom because they're dead. In verse 2 he says, For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. Paul here, he's comparing marriage to our relationship with Christ. The word marriage means union, means being in harmony. It's a union between man and woman. When God instituted marriage in the Garden of Gethsemane, see, he never intended for folks to swap out the wives and for wives to swap out the husband. We're here tonight. He never intended for us to get a divorce. The husband and wife are committed to each other until one of them dies. 
Now that's Bible. Now there, God has some other stipulations. He has some, and we'll talk about it. Let's talk about marriage. So we find, amen, that marriage is between a man and a woman. That's how God set it up. There are certain grounds to be divorced. Let's see what Jesus says about this in Matthew chapter 19, verse 3. There's certain grounds. We're talking about marriage. The Bible says this. The Pharisees also came unto him, him being Jesus, tempting him and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? We just covered that. And said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and, the, and they twain shall be one flesh. He didn't say you take your family with you and, you and you and your wife live together. No. He said you leave your parents, you leave mama's basement, you get the bottle out your mouth, be a husband, take care of your wife. Oh, yeah. He said then you cleave, amen, you get attached to your wife. And he's saying, man, you're not two anymore, you're one. See, that's what real marriage is. It's being on one accord. That's a lifetime. It takes a lifetime to do that. But he's saying, man, you leave your mom, your dad, you leave your friends. Man, the married folks shouldn't be, shouldn't be hanging out with single people. Your wife should be your best friend. Your husband should be your best friend. He says this. He says, wherefore they are no more twain, in other words, two. They're no more two, but one flesh. What therefore God have joined together, let no man put asunder. You shouldn't let things or people come between you and your wife. Wife, you shouldn't let people or things come between you and your husband. He said, don't let anybody put asunder. Don't let anybody divide you. Don't let your kids divide you. You and your husband got to be tight like nuts and bolts. You and your wife got to be tight like nuts and bolts. Let no man put us on. He's talking about marriage. This is Jesus. He said, they say unto him, why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? He said unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. He said, Moses allowed you to do it because you were hard in heart. You were hard-headed. You know how hard-headed folks is. Y'all had kids. Y'all got kids out there. They don't listen. You tell them to do so, they do the exact opposite of what you told them to do. He said, the reason Moses gave you an outroad or inroad, I should say, is because of the hardness of your heart. Man, these folks, these guys, if the wife burnt the toast, if the wife messed up the food, they got rid of them. If they wasn't wanting a better-looking wife, they got rid of them. And so Moses allowed, allowed that to happen because he didn't want these women being mistreated, basically. But check this out. In verse 8, he says, he said unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, he suffered you to put away your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. And I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her which is put away, doeth commit adultery. Jesus said, you only get, you only get one out rule. The only time it's okay to get married to somebody else, if you've been married, it says your wife cheats on you or the husband cheats on you. Well, preacher, my husband, oh, well, you should have thought about that before you got married. <laughs> well, my wife don't know how to cook. You should have thought about that before you got married. He said, it's self for fornication. And also, of course, Paul, he deals with this too. He says if the husband or wife is a, he, he lets us know if the husband, if, and that if you're abandoned and you're a believer, that's also another inroad or an outroad, I should say, a way out. Let's say it that way. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, 7 verse 15 says, but if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in such case, but God hath called us to peace. And so, you got saved, amen, and your wife leaves God, leaves you, well, then it's okay to get a divorce. Likewise, wife the same. But Paul, he's using a metaphor to show us our relationship with Jesus. In Romans chapter 7, verse 3, he says, So then, if while your husband liveth, she be 
she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from the law, so that she is no more adulteress. Thou shalt be married to another man. And so we understand, amen, if somebody dies, it's free. You're okay to be get married. But let's talk about what he's meaning in terms of the spiritual application. Paul is letting us know we've divorced the old life. We don't have the old husband anymore, the old man. Let's say it that way. We don't have the old man anymore. We, we're new creatures in Christ. We've divorced the old man. Are you with us now? Your old man, you remember that used to be a saying, still is, I think. People say, my old man, my husband, or whatever. No, now we've divorced him. We've divorced the old man, the old ideas, the old stinking thinking, everything. We've divorced it. We're new creatures now. We died to sin and no longer are joined to it. Therefore, we are no longer under, under its penalty. Saints, Jesus did not redeem us for us to go back. Hosea, he serves to be an excellent example of what Jesus did for us. All, the, all of this is in the context of marriage. The Bible tells us his wife was a harlot. And the Bible lets us know that she cheated on him. But God told Hosea to buy her back. And in Hosea chapter 3 verse 2, he says this. So I brought her to me for 15 pieces of silver and for a homer of barley and a half homer of barley. And I said unto her, thou shalt abide for me many days. Thou shalt not play the harlot and thou shalt not be for another man. So will I also be for thee. Folks, think about that for a little bit. Hosea got cheated on. He was married. God had told this man to get married, illustrating how God, Israel had forsaken God. But God had brought them back, still loved Israel, still chased after Israel. And so Hosea was doing the same thing with, 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 uh, uh, with his wife, amen, with this, with this harlot. And so the lady even ended up having a baby on him, but he still brought her back. And you think about us, amen, and how we cheated on God on all points, amen, and how God, how his son, how he delivered us from the power of darkness and how he translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. The Bible says, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Jesus, he redeemed us. He redeemed us. He paid our ransom, saints. Just like Hosea redeemed his wife, she mistreated him, did all these things. In Romans chapter 7, verse 4, we're about to close. The Bible says, What for, my brethren, ye, are also, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. We've divorced the old life. We've died to it. Now we're candidates to be in a relationship with Jesus. And this isn't weird or whatever. Like I said, the word merit means union, being in union with God. And so we're in a relationship with God once we die. Once we die to self, once we come to Calvary, once we pick up our cross and so forth and follow Christ, amen. And we believe that God raised his son from the dead from the heart. We are saved at that point. And so He's, he's letting us know now we should have fruit to God. And he says this, he says, For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sins which were by the law did work in our members to bring forth unto death. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in the newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. He frees us from death so we can be in a relationship with him. God wants nothing more that to have a relationship with you and I. He really wants to be in fellowship with us, in harmony with us. This is exactly how this is exactly how it was in the beginning. God would come down and fellowship with Adam in the cool of the day. But then one day Adam disobeyed God and ran from the presence of God. And God had to call him because he wasn't where he was supposed to be. You call people when they're not next to you. And so now God has to call men and women out of darkness now. We see the effects of sin even today. God is still calling men and women out of darkness. 
Because man isn't where he's supposed to be. The Bible says Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. From that day forward, Adam wasn't a new creature. He was no longer innocent. No longer in fellowship with God. He sold the human race out. He sold his relationship out with God and his authority. But Jesus, in the fullness of time, he brought us back. Jesus did what Adam could not do. And I was walking the light all the way. He was obedient all the way. Now God has highly exalted him and given him a name above every name. Jesus makes it possible for us to be in fellowship with God. When we were alienated, you think about that. We were foreigners. We didn't speak God's language. But Jesus really did make the difference. And so he's letting us know that we can walk with God now. We can be in union with God now. And that's the blessed part about being a Christian. We can be in fellowship with God every day. We can be in harmony with him every day of our lives. God bless you. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you, God, for this Bible study. We thank you for the moving of your spirit. We thank you for the love of God, the sweet fellowship, and this joy that we have because of your precious son giving his life, paying our ransom, God, show us, God, empower each one that receives Christ by faith to live for you each and every day of their lives. In Christ's name, we pray and ask. Amen. We'll see you Thursday night, midweek service at 7.30 p.m. God bless you as I pray.